Kamar Robertson, their best long-range shooter. Sean Walker, the son of a coach. Guy who runs the point for them but can also hit him from outside. Off the turnover, Bears keep it in their end. Sean Walker, again, he can score the ball, but his real value is a lockdown defender. They'll need him against that multiple Furman perimeter attack. Not that time for Robertson. Last night, Mercer shot just 29% beyond the arc, but they took their fair share. Furman Paladins lineup presented by Ingles. Marcus Foster, the fourth-year junior, can't get it to go down. Keep an eye on him. J.P. Pegues has emerged mightily in his second season in the program. That's Pegues coming away with the Furman Paladins. That's hard to believe. We've done a number of those games over the years. Some have been close, some not so close. I would have lost that bet, though. My guess is if the Bears can keep this game more in a half-court setting, they've got a chance to pull the upset. Bears in the black out of Macon, Georgia, the Furman Paladins from Greenville, South Carolina. Shot clock coming up on 10 for James Glisson and the Mercer Bears. Luis Hurtado looked inside for McCreary. Sean Walker notices the shot clock's under five. Can't get it off the glass. Hurtado runs it down. James Glisson from downtown. And the ball comes down to Garrahine. Throughout the Ingalls SoCon Championships, Ingalls presents our starting lineups. And for Luis Hurtado and the Mercer Bears, they are trying to pick up a 15th win on the season. Kamar Robertson, their best long-range shooter. Sean Walker, the son of a coach. Guy who runs the point for them but can also hit him from outside. Off the turnover, Bears keep it in their end. Sean Walker, again, he can score the ball, but his real value is a lockdown defender. They'll need him against that multiple Furman perimeter attack. Not that time for Robertson. Last night, Mercer shot just 29% beyond the arc, but they took their fair share. Furman Paladins lineup presented by Ingalls. Marcus Foster, the fourth-year junior, can't get it to go down. Keep an eye on him. J.P. Pegues has emerged mightily in his second season in the program. That's Pegues coming away with the turnover. Now if I'm Pegues, I've got a little chip on my shoulder, not voted to any of the all-conference teams. He's as important as and, value, as, and as valuable to any Paladin. Mike Bothwell, fifth-year senior along with Slauson. SoCon scoring leader as this afternoon begins. He's one of the Southern Conference best perimeter players. Well, he erased any doubts last weekend in that win at Samford. When he had 35, he had had three straight single-digit scoring games. There was a little bit of doubt. He had hit his rhythm late in the season. Slauson picking up his first personal. Free throws upcoming for Jalen McCreary. And let's bring in the third member of our team, courtside, Aaron Summers. Aaron. Thanks, Pete. Esther Furman lost here in the championship game in heartbreaking fashion. Head coach Bob Ritchie said that he got together with his team and he told them they could use it as a stumbling block or a stepping stone. They decided that they were going to use it as fuel, and it has driven them through the offseason and through this season with a sense of urgency to get back to this very spot. A number one seed with an opportunity at a championship here. He said, though, that he's asked them to try to separate the two seasons. This is a different team, and he wants them to release the pressure of being back in Asheville. Just go out here and have fun today, guys. Dean, in complete candor, as McCreary ties us up at two, I wasn't sure when I first saw Bob Ritchie after that heartbreaking loss against Chattanooga how to kind of open up the topic with him. He has used it, as Aaron noted, as a motivational tool as much as any coach I've ever seen use that kind of defeat. Well, I think you have to because it's it's gonna it's a storyline for this conference and really March Madness. Garrett Heen from downtown. A big who can step out. 38% beyond the arc for the junior out of shore. Hurtado defended by Boston. And if Heen starts making threes, boy, that's that's trouble for the Bears. McCreary. He lives in the lane. Let me say something now. Jalen Slauson is as good. He was the defensive player of the year a year ago. He was second in the voting to UNCG's Kobe Langley this year. But he's going to have troubles with McCreary. I mean, McCreary's got size, athleticism. He's a lefty. 
Lawson past Glisson. Nice move. He wanted the foul call. But he threw just enough English on it off the glass to get it in. Again, if you're Mercer, you're going to have to try to get some easy baskets somehow, some way, but you can't get into a track meet with Furman. Hurtado has the size advantage on Pagese. Gets a screen from Glisson on the runner. Ryan transfer gets his own rebound. Can't get the putback. McCreary follows. Not sure he realized the shot clock had reset to 20. He's off to a good start. It's a one-point game. He's so good on the baseline. Going over that right shoulder. Pagese defended out high. Slosson from downtown. Heen last to touch it. Think they're going to let him play inside today, Dean. Greg Gary would take that. Head coach of the Mercer Bears, now in season number four, trying to get a 66 win at the helm. His first head coaching job won the year. You kind of have to give him a pass on. He took over the Centenary Gents out in Shreveport, Louisiana, but right around the time he became the head coach, they announced they were dropping down to Division Three. So he did his best in his two-year stint there. A longtime assistant to Matt Painter at Purdue. Worked at Duquesne, among other stuff. Yeah, he's worked with some great coaches. You don't become Matt Painter's offensive coordinator if you don't know what you're doing. Kamar Robertson hopping down the lane. First player not named Jayla McCreary to score points this afternoon for Mercer. And Hurtado will pick up his first personal foul. The Bears try and end a long skid in the series. The Paladins trying to avenge heartbreak. Game on. Furman, the best scoring team in the league. And for Furman, share the wealth. What do we what do we mean? The Paladins are deep. Multiple guys can beat you. That doesn't mean this doesn't need to be a one-on-one -on -one game. JP Pegues averages more than 11 points a game. Been an offensive weapon for them. Foul called in the rebound try. It'll go against Kamar Robertson. Number two on the Bears early on. And out of that timeout, J.P. Pagese, no passes, right? Dribble right into a three. Not that he's not a capable scorer, but you just don't need that right now. Share the wealth. Mike Bothwell. Last Saturday, we saw him down in Birmingham, Alabama. There was no one hotter in the country. Ben Vanderwall kept the possession alive, and Pagese, 36% from downtown. Paladins move back in front. Well, that's where you generally get your best threes on those long rebounds. Defenses are in a scramble situation. John Canones, a freshman out of Orlando, on the court, gives it away to Robertson. McCreary may not leave the floor today. Fires over Williams. No. Rebound. It'll stay in the Mercer end. Ben Vanderwall pleading his case. Pete, you bring up a good point about McCreary. I mean, he's got to put points on the board. Now, he's going to need help. He put that shot up there, fell a little short. Vanderbilt trying to sell it. I, he might have been right. It could have been off that black uniform's heel. But that guy right, right there. did not score at the game down in Macon, Georgia. And he had 10 points a week and a half ago on their three-point loss in Greenville. So you know what the scouting report was for Furman. Canone's strong move. Listen, deflecting the rebound, it gets out to Robertson. And a foul be called over the back. And that's the first on Jalen McCreary. Began his career at South Florida. Ended up playing for South Carolina and Frank Martin. And here he is in his first season under Greg Gary. He's a guy who really competes. Now he is going to have to watch fouls. He picked up two fairly quick last night. But that actually turned out to help Mercer uh, in the in the big win over the Citadel. They didn't need his minutes as they will today. Mercer held the Citadel in Friday night's game to four points deep into the opening half of play. Three late free throws by Madison Durr in the closing seconds of that opening half. What got the Citadel in double figures at the break? They were down 27 to 10. Bothwell. What a performer he has been, really, since his second season in Bob Ritchie's program. He's been a go-to guy. Certainly has. That's a fifth-year guy going against a true freshman in Jacquinones. 
And even though Quinones has got a good build and body to him, that's going to be a tough one-on-one -on -one matchup. The kick to Quinones. Sean Grant comes away with it. And the foul is called. Grant's a guy we haven't talked about yet. He can really compete inside, but boy, on that previous possession at the Furman end, you know, Bothwell just four or five dribbles, gets himself in the paint, and when he gets in there and the double team doesn't come, he can score over most Southern Conference perimeter defenders. Bothwell scored Furman's first 18 points last Saturday in their SOCON number one seed clinching win at Sanford. Grant at the line. Injury issues have plagued the junior throughout this campaign. Silicog, Alabama, just 54% on free throws. But the most sizable player, just about every time the Bears take the court, and he's on there. 6'10, 280. Well, we saw it on that rebound. He's got soft hands and a good feel, and he and he competes. He has battled, according to the coaches, a foot injury all season long, has never been able to really find his true rhythm and flow. But he deals with it as best he can. And yeah, he's another important piece here this afternoon. Grant will be vital inside, not only spelling McCreary and giving him a rest, but figure out a way to contain Jalen Slauson, the guy on the floor right now, Tyree Shuey down low. And even helping defending down low against the likes of Mike Bothwell, who cuts to his right and pulls up. Soft touch out of Cleveland Heights, Ohio, fifth year senior. So smooth. I mean, you see the last two possessions. Kind of the bully ball in the paint and then the pull up right there from the free throw line. Reason why he scored 1,935 points entering today's game. Pertano way outside. Bears coming into the game 34% as a team from beyond the arc. Carter Witt, the Wake Forest transfer in his first season in Bob Ritchie's program. Williams on the wing. Huey who can step out. Just into the game. Braden Sparks, a walk on. Saw his playing time increase for Mercer. Canone's defended by Bothwell. Bothwell, I think, is their best on-ball defender. He certainly is. Now, look, through some substitutions, though, you really don't have a pure three-point shooter out there. Somebody's going to have to make a shot for the Bears. How about Luis Hurtado? Just 29% on threes coming in. Back to a one-point game. Yeah, with Zanoni and Glisson and others on the bench... Nice to see if you're a Bears fan, Hurtado step up and make that. Bothwell, 17 points in the game in Macon. Body slide, it'll go the other way. Hurtado kicks it, eventually Grant. And Williams at 6'5", able to box out and pull down the rebound. A lot of purple in this arena for the Furman Paladins. And we have heard their spirit. Reach and foul called on Hurtado. Number two on the Bryan transfer. He's got good good size as a guard. Again, not known as a three-point shooter, but had his feet set. Bothwell too late on the closeout on the skip pass inside out. And back to something you've said, right? Really from the tip, the officials are really gonna let this thing play. I mean, we've seen some physicality and bodies flying as Hurtado takes a breather. And so now it's up to the players both ways. They've got to adjust that this is going to be a physical game. Slauson back on the floor with Heen. McGee's getting the screen. Robertson chasing. Whip from the wing. Heen inside. Shot clock resetting. Grant defending Whip. Robertson with the pick. Grant kicks, sparks, and then it comes down to Marcus Foster. Marcus Foster with Slauson and Bothwell moving on after this season should become the star for the Paladins along with McGee's next year. Yeah, those two make a good backcourt. Then you had Alex Williams in there. Going to miss that guy, although Slauson can't get the roll. I have seen him express displeasure multiple times in the early going. Toward the gentlemen who are officiating. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, there's a faster pace now here in the last couple of minutes, but the Bears been able to contain things and keep this 
at a low scoring game. Robertson from two. Known more as a three point shooter. Three lead changes so far. Second time Mercer's been in front. And a turnover. Mercer Bears coming in. Pretty good defensive team. And they've shown it so far. Both teams want to play half court man to man. They both talk very well defensively. Look at the big fellow with the soft touch. Well, if he gets his groove on here, he's going to be a problem as well. Because then you got to worry about him and McCreary. Three and set. McGee's explores. Heen out front. Oh, that's big. Garrett Heen, another three-pointer for the 6'9 junior. That's his second shot from behind the arc. Stops a 7-0 run for the Mercer Bears. Well, this happened a little bit yesterday. The Bears went on a run when McCrary went to the bench. So they're proving that they can play without him. They've had good ball movement. They're playing around Shannon Grant, which I think behooves them offensively. 16-3 run with McCreary not on the court last night as they jumped out to a lead. Robertson, shot clock under five. Canones doesn't realize it. Didn't get it off in time. Got a timeout on the court. You can't help but notice Shannon Grant on the floor. And you can't help but notice his touch. Uh, he's got great hands, great teams. It's open from the time the game starts until the very last game of the night. And you can go in right on the concourse. So as soon as you come in and pay your ticket, it's right there. Awesome. All right, guys, if you can't find me later, it's because I'm in the fan zone. Okay, Pete? Aaron, we would understand what Melissa and her folks have provided here around this tournament next level. Dean, it is such a great experience as McGee's is foul driving inside. Braden Sparks picking up his first. I mean, this this atmosphere, you go anywhere in the country to a conference tournament, it will not surpass what they've got going on here. No, the city of Asheville, and in particular Ingalls, it just they do a wonderful job. This is the right place, the right venue for Southern Conference tournament basketball. Guy from Nashville playing in Asheville, J.P. Pegues, sophomore for the Paladins. Good in so many ways this year, and the thing that really jumps off the page to his head coach, Bob Ritchie, second in the league in assist per game and assist to turnover ratio, and he's not bad from the line either. Makes two there, 70% on the season. Well, when you assist well and you get to the free throw line, it suggests you're, suggests you're unselfish, and that's what Pegues is. Boy, he's been so good after replacing Alex Hunter as we see Furman out of the timeout in a 1-3-1 half-court track. I haven't seen a lot of that this year out of him. Something new as they enter the tournament. So you go to the corner, and Grant gets the offensive rebound. Underneath Robertson, who just missed. Sparks, plenty of time on the shot clock. They'll reset. And that's where the three-point shots will come from in the corner. You're trying to attack the free-throw line area if you can. More than likely, you're going to be able to get some shots from the corner. Five on the shot clock. Slauson will be called for the foul. Well, the Bears dodged a bullet right there. They handled that pretty well. That was unexpected. They were able to recycle that possession. And then Robertson on the drive. And you see Slauson reaching in there. Again, both teams primarily half-court man-to-man. Pretty interesting little twist there to see Bob Ritchie and the Paladins go to that half-court track. Mar Robertson, part of the team, a couple of seasons back, that played for the SoCon title. Made a run from Friday to Monday. They lost to UNCG, but they were trying to pull off something that hasn't been done in this league since 1939. Clemson did it over in Raleigh. You were telling me about that. Clemson won it, but then they didn't participate in the NCAA tournament. Spring football started shortly thereafter. But to me, the quaintest story about that whole tournament run where the team stayed, they walked past the trophy store that provided the trophy for the champion each day when they went from their hotel to the gym uh, to play the games, the Coliseum. And they all stopped and looked at the trophy, and it motivated them to win the championship. So as a result, uh, the Tigers I, I didn't go it. to an NCAA tournament until 1980. But we digress. Pegues from downtown for Furman. What a good sophomore he is. Paladins back up by three. I think he's the best second-year player in the Southern Conference. You mentioned it, boy. He's going to be a mainstay at the point guard slot. There's 
others that will fill in through graduation, but first things first, Paladin's trying to win here in advance. Pegues defending Robertson. He was trying to induce the foul. Pegues and McCrary picks up his second. That's a headline with 7.49 to go in the opening period. J.P. Pegues, maybe he'll be the star this year for the Paladins as they hope to go on. Try to use that, as well as his veterans, to motivate on this year's trip into this arena. Well, there's nothing you can do but try to use that as a motivational tool. It's hanging over their head. A program that has not been to the NCAA tournament in over 40 years. I think he's handled it and attacked it the right way as a coach. McGee's eight points in nine minutes tries to get it to Heen. Had Bothwell cutting the lane. How about Foster? Dean, you mentioned a faster pace. Furman would love to get this to a Foster pace. Their fourth year junior, he can fill it up in a hurry. He can. You know, before that last break, McCreary picked up his second foul. That is a that is a big time watch out here in the last seven plus minutes of this first half. Game within the game, Greg Geary's gonna have to manage McCreary's time. Back to your point about Foster. He is many times the X factor for this Paladins team. Does a little bit of everything for him and including making shots behind the arc. Picked up his first personal. Paladins have built their largest lead of the opening half. Ember McCreary, top weapon for the Mercer Bears over on the bench with a couple of personal fouls. Kamar Robertson will try to pick up the slack, as will James Listen. Keen defends the senior. The Bears just one of eight behind the arc. Now one of nine. Paladins will live with that. Alice Williams in the front court. Bothwell will set it up. The beauty of Mike Bothwell. He could guard a post if he had to, as Glisson will pick up the personal. He can run the point. He can be a two. They've used him as a three. Keen hitting the deck. He's he's a true guard. Right? I mean, he you're exactly right. Can play multiple positions. He's more he's more become more well rounded every year at Furman. You know, his his assists are up this year. He's distributing more than ever, but yet his field goal percentage is also up. Over 50%. Garrett Heen can't get the bounce on the front end of the one and one. Just over six and a half to go before the break. That was a seven foul against the Mercer Bears. That's always surprised me. Heen just has knocked down two threes, but he's a sub 60% free throw shooter. Williams defending Canones. John Canones, shot clock at five. Walker around a screen. Oh, that's huge for Sean Walker out of Elizabeth City, North Carolina. That is not an easy shot. All Paladin defenders knew that clock was running down. They were locked in. And to dribble to your left, your offhand into a three. Terrific shot by Walker and much needed. He hit a couple of threes in that spot on the floor. Listen, defends McGee's got the size advantage. He stay with him on quickness. Williams, good outside shooter. Keen takes the rebound away from Robertson. Back over to the Bears. What a nice job by Kamar Robertson at 6-2, hanging with the 6-9 Garrett Heen. And Robertson going way out of the ballpark, but here he comes back. Bahati's flying. Yeah, both Robertson and Quinones. Now, Heen reached over Robertson for that rebound, but he did a nice job of just walling up. And just there was nowhere to go for Heen to throw he either shoot it or throw the pass well, Bothwell to defend in the backcourt to kind of continue the story about his versatility as Bob Ritchie and I spoke yesterday We determined that a guy from the football rich state of Ohio if he'd elected to go the Gridiron route probably could make himself some kind of safety Greg Gary for now wants to try to contain the basketball player that is Mike Bothwell and this number one seed and Spring an opening game upset here on quarterfinal Saturday. Two really good basketball minds, Bob Ritchie and Greg Gary. They love the game within the game. Individual matchups, offenses. As you see, Glisson right there softly off the glass. He's played well here in the first half. Each will appreciate that the senior used the window. So many good X's and O's coaches in this Southern Conference. Ten teams for men's basketball. Very competitive league this year. It's been RPI, net top 10, whatever metric you want to use over the past few seasons. Foster, splits defender. Can break it down at 64. 
that's another individual move. Nice job by Foster. Yeah, to your point, it, it, is the Southern Conference down slightly net, you know, whatever metric this year? Yes, but it's a terrific league, great coaches, great players. And, and, and really, like, the three really good teams at Furman, Sanford, and UNCG, but yet the other seven all have a chance to win on any given night. Keen, way outside. Vanderwall fouled, chasing the rebound. Ben Vanderwall, you see the energy he brings just outside of Chicago. He's had a very important freshman year for that man, Bob Ritchie. Yeah, freshman on freshman right there. Vanderwall just got the better of Zanoni, who didn't put a body on him. He was able to get to the rim. Vanderwall, a little turnover prone early in the non-conference season, but that's normal for a freshman, particularly when you're playing the teams they did. Belmont, South Carolina, Old Dominion, etc. And uh, he has really found his niche within this eight or nine man rotation. 67% this year from the line and more from Aaron Summers. Aaron? The freshman Ben Vanderwall is somebody that head coach Bob Ritchie called a coach's dream. He does absolutely all of the little things that have a big effect on the game. He's not afraid to take a charge. He goes after the offensive rebounds as we just saw him get that foul drawn on the last one there. He's somebody that's been a crucial piece for this Furman squad off of the bench this season. He Made one of two four-point lead. Paladins have been up by as many as six in this opening half. They're trying to make it 18 straight in the series. Bob Ritchie has never lost a game as a head coach against Mercer. Listen, no. Canones able to take it away from Foster. Goes up over Witt. Follow. Listen. The senior rising. He doesn't want it to be his final game. He's not shot it well from behind the arc, which was really something he did well early in his career, but... Know, right there, he knew that they had a chance at a second opportunity. Nice job running to the rim. I think he's the Bears' best offensive rebounder. Bothwell, strong move. Walker fouling him. Sean Walker and the Mercer Bears hanging around against Furman. Third meeting of the season. They're trying to break through. Players on that Furman team. Al Henderson, their point guard. He and Evans were high school teammates with a player named Everett Sullivan, who then went on to Louisville. He just went right up 385 from Hillcrest High in the Golden Strip area of Greenville County for their college careers. Waugh and Evans went on to be head coaches on the college level. Waugh at Stetson, Evans at Division II Lander, Greenwood, South Carolina. Sean Walker trying to spoil the Paladins' first number one seed here, just as Appalachian State did back in 1991. Walker. Tom Apke's Mountaineers knocked him out on a Saturday. We're tied up once more. Yep, Walker just blew by Bothwell right there. Listen, defending Foster. The Geese came off, uh, came along with a flurry of points earlier. He's been quiet since. Foster can't find the handle. Paladins give it up about 11 and a half times per game, and that is their fourth so far. Walker was a point guard in high school. Now, that's been several years ago. And I'm sorry, he blew by Foster. That was not Bothwell. But regardless, both Paladins, really good one-on-one -on -one defenders. Walker made them look like they were sitting in cement boots. Fourth time we've been tied. Coming up on two and a half to go before the break. Bullet pass underneath Hurtado. Robertson was too far under. The Geese defend. Canones kind of trying to find his way in his freshman year. They think he's got a bright future. Off a screen from Glisson. Shot clock under five. Robertson with a hand in his face. Slauson defended. Glisson rebounds. Mercer back in front. 6-0 run for the Bears to retake the lead. There's a little bit of growing belief. I know there's a lot of time in this ball game, but you sense the energy out of the Bears right now. They came in confident after competing toe-to-toe -to -toe with these Paladins just over a week and a half ago. The Geese. Vanderwall battling with Robertson, who's able to get it to his teammate Hurtado. Hurtado back on the court with two personals. McCrary remains on the bench, but like last night, things have gone reasonably well for the Bears with their top scorer McCrary on the sideline. As long as you can stay even or just above the line, if you're Greg Gary, keep your leading score on the bench. Vanderwall on the shoot tops of Hurtado. Shot clock under 10 once more, but they want to go deep in the count. Trying to take as much time off the game clock as they can. 
Just one catch and shoot. Robertson didn't release it in time. Well, there's been a couple. They, yes, they do want to go late into the shot clock, but it's interesting. There's been a couple of possessions where I don't know that the Bears recognized they were under five seconds. And thus it's led to shot clock violations. Third shot clock violation of this opening half for the Mercer Bears. The Paladins' last field goal at 4.57 on the game clock. Coming up on one to go in the half. Slauson far from the hoop, but he can be dangerous out there. Canones on the bump. I think Greg Gary and the Mercer Bears thought that that was on Slauson pushing off. Billy Dunlop, the official, thought else. Otherwise, we'll watch it again. He's just backing in. But Greg Gary right there in Billy Dunlop's ear. 50-50 call. Jalen Sloss into the line. Yep, those are two big bodies. SoCon Player of the Year in the top five or top ten of all the key categories. And for a big man, very good free throw shooter, 78%. It's a high school football player at Pinewood Prep in the low country of South Carolina just outside of Charleston. And back to a one-point game. I don't know that you could draw up a career much better than what Jalen Slauson has done in his time other than advance to the NCAA tournament. He, he's just gotten better and better. He's been a great teammate. Just everything that you would want out of a student athlete. Bothwell defends as Canones brings it midcourt. Don't know if Mercer goes two for one here. They would have had to work faster. And pardon me for trying to do math on the fly. <laughs> no, but I think at this point you're exactly right. They just they just want a good quality shot, knowing they're up one. Canones on Bothwell, freshman over senior. I haven't seen that in the games I've seen Mercer play in person this year out of John Canones. Off the dribble. Well, that's impressive right there. And now minimally, unless you foul a three-point... Shooter, you're going to go in tied or with the lead if you're the Mercer Bears. Really about as close to a perfect pass half as you could have asked for if you're Greg Garrett. But he's defended by Robertson. Forcing it. Glisson battling for the rebound. One second exactly. Bob Ritchie with the use it or lose it. Versatility of a big point guard. J.P. Pegues, a fine point guard for the Paladins. Slauson out high, defended by Walker. And we arrive at halftime. A very competitive first half, as you can see by the score. A very entertaining first half. And one that gives us some building drama. The Mercer Bears, the number two in our open. McCreary for Mercer. Slauson for Furman. Both are on the floor to start the second half. Each a couple of personal fouls over the first 20 minutes. Think about this, McCreary scored the first six points for the Bears and then really was a non-factor, again, because of those fouls. It was halfway down for McCreary. It'll go the other way. Uh, Bob, uh, halfway down, rather, for Slauson. Yeah. It'll go the other way. Uh, Bob Ritchie likes to try to get guys going. You know, a couple of games ago, he wanted to try to get Bothwell going right here out of the halftime. I think he wants to get Jalen Slauson going just a little bit offensively. Full court pressure. Tato able to clear after the Paladins backed off. Bears trying to make it two wins in less than 24 hours here in Nashville. They won decisively last night against the Citadel. Robertson driving on Foster. Hurtado from the right wing. Misses badly. Listen. Shot clock violation. The ball never hit the rim. It was late on the call, but I think it was obvious that if they review it, that'll clarify. I don't think there's any question. Hurtado was just throwing it up. I, I, he was really the only bear that recognized the shot clock was down. Watch it here again. That's Hurtado's shot. And boy, just, boy, here's a better view. It just, just does not hit the rim. That can't get a better picture than that right there. Great job by the crew. Fourth shot clock violation for the Bears in this game. Keen. Off well defended by Walker. Now McCreary. 
Foster out front. And Walker takes it off the floor. So we talked at length last night as they went up convincingly against the Citadel and were never really challenged how important that could be for Mercer as far as their legs. Playing a 5 o'clock game on a Friday, tipping off at noon against a tough team to face on a Saturday. And James Glisson coming to this tournament wanting to make a statement. The senior from just outside of Atlanta. Other end, count it. And Pagis will head of the line. You got a feeling that this game is going to take on a whole nother level of concentration and competitiveness as, after Glisson hits his fourth shot. Look, you cannot celebrate when you're playing the Furman Paladins. Generally, it's by the pass ahead. This time it was by the dribble ahead by J.P. Pagis. That's just not acceptable in a conference tournament one and done. You've got to get back. Tamar Robertson picking up his second personal foul. Let's send it over to Aaron, who spoke with Bob Ritchie coming out of the locker room. Coach Ritchie said he just felt like his team was playing a little bit too tight through the first half of play, and he asked them to settle down a little bit. They missed some uncharacteristic free throws, obviously coming out with a lot more energy here in the second half, and he said he wanted them to be aggressive on the boards as well. And the Furman fans providing energy. Talked to his team. I'm sure he talked to his staff first to say, how do we get this game faster? How do we get our guys kind of playing a little looser, a little freer up and down? And I I like that kind of change, if you will. And a guy who won Defensive Player of the Year last year brings some energy off a steal. Slauson, he wants to be heard from. Nearly a turnover in the backcourt. Even though the Bears have really the equivalent of three point guards for Tato, Robertson, and Walker on the on the floor, they're not real good against pressure. Foul will be called. Robertson almost got caught bailing out. Jalen Slauson can change a game and locks away. Well, he is such a good defender, and then that's a possible SC top ten. He just stripped her Tato cleanly, and he, he knows how to finish. My goodness. First foul on Bothwell. Robertson can't save it. Oh, this full court pressure has changed the dynamic of the game here in the first two and a half minutes. Credit Bob Ritchie for deciding we've got to do something. We cannot just sit back and let Mercer dictate. Well, and Greg Gary, the Mercer head coach, will be the first to tell you every scouting report about his team says they've had issues at point guard. They do not yep. have the ball handlers like a Pagese or others in the SOCON. Big reason why they didn't finish higher in the standings. Back door, Bothwell. He'll go to the line. Off the feed from Slauson. One of the more energetic players you'll find along with his teammate, Slauson, in the SOCON. Well, a terrific setup and back cut by Bothwell right there. When you're overplayed, what do you do? You don't fight the defense. You go back door. He sees Walker leaning. He knows exactly what to do with it. So does his teammate. He's just mad he can't finish. He leads this team at 85% on free throws. And it feels like there's just a huge momentum swing right now. I think as much to do with that as there's just a large contingent. Probably 80% of the fans in here are clad in purple. 7-0 run here early in the second half. The full court pressure of Furman has been the story. Walker to Glisson. Ahead to Robertson. Now they've got the numbers. McCrary a little bit too strong in the pass. Couldn't get the handle. And Robertson with some kind of play. Was able to deflect it. And Bothwell couldn't find the handle. Well, I understand what Kamar Robertson was trying to do. It was a two-on-one. But boy, in a game situation when things are going so fast, just you wanted points in that possession. You wanted to try to get the tie. Don't go for the, the home run play in that alley oop to McCreary. Bears need to get this game back to the pace that they desire. Hard time getting it in for Canones. Walker out high. Foster defends. McCreary loves the mid range. Pagis will pull it down. One and done. Nobody on the glass that time for the Bears, although I think there's probably a concerted effort to get back right now. Lawson had a head of steam. Bothwell also 
Battling inside. Walker comes away with it. Now the Bears are going to try to run. McCreary. Nice touch. Good job by Slauson not to commit his third foul trailer. Very much so. Tied up again after we just had our sixth lead change. Pagis on the drive. 9-2 run for the Paladins. You can't like where this is headed right now if you're the Bears. It's just, it, it's too fast. They're not, they're not going to be able to sustain this over the course of the next 16 minutes. Robertson in transition. Almost came down through. Off the top of the backboard. Paladins led by as many as six in the opening half. Greg Gary having already used the second time out in this half. Just hoping he can keep it right here until the under 16. Walker pulls it down off the foster miss. That's exactly what he's thinking. He wants to try to have a couple of those timeouts in his back pocket. He knows the next dead ball right now is going to a chance for him to have two minutes with these guys. Heen just took a shot to the neck. That's him down on the floor. Listen, McCreary, one-hander. And Slauson deflecting it, and now play is going to be stopped. And Garrett Heen in some pain right now, as you can see. See if he in that full court that Mercer had just three turnovers in the first half. They've now got four. We played just over four minutes here in the second half. Offensively, the Paladins, an efficient team. Among the top ten coming out of the regular season in NCAA assist to turnover ratio. And they're efficient with the ball. Pagese, efficient from long range as well. Five-point advantage, one shy of their biggest lead. That was back in the opening half. Now you got Vanderwall in the front of that press at 6-7. Long length. Confusion for Mercer. Williams. Offensive foul, the call. That's a gigantic <laughs> bailout for the Mercer Bears. <laughs> Boy, that was a tough one right there. We'll watch it again. Was he moving or not? Here's Alex Williams with the ball. Uh, clearly, Louis, Luis Hurtado was outside the restricted arc. The question is, was he moving at all? We'll let that one go. Play on. It would have been the third on Hurtado. You could tell on the previous pass of the front court, Sparks and McCrary were confused. And now Canones was going in the opposite direction of the ball. And now turnover number six. Uh, Pete, you and I do a lot of Southern Conference games. They're really outside of Samford. Nobody else presses full court a lot. And so you really, over the course of the last two, two and a half months, Mercer has not seen this kind of pressure. I think you'd agree. VMI would if they had more depth. Absolutely would have. But but the Paladins, such an effective half-court defensive team. Bothwell. He gets hot. This one could be over in a hurry. And Greg Gary recognizing that. Furman trail by three at the half. The season and head coach Bob Ritchie said he wasn't exactly sure how that was going to play out. Usually there's a lot of expectations and pressure on players like that when they come back. But he said that they handled it so well. They took on the responsibility of being the go-to guys for this team. It took them a little while to figure out how to be the greatest leaders for this team. But he said he's been so pleased with the way that they have excelled both as leaders and on the court, having their best years as for the Paladins, guys. One had to be Batman, the other had to be Robin. They figured it out early on in their careers, and they've kind of swapped roles game to game since. Now, both could have made an argument for player of the year. I think Bothwell's handled it well. Vanderwall, his first SoCon tourney game. McCrary on the rejection. And then the foul is called. Go against Sean Walker. That'll be the third on the senior guard. Now, so often you hear people talk about where well, the team with the better players generally wins, but we're seeing an example right here of how coaching wins games as well. Bob Ritchie going to that full court pressure. It not only caused confusion and turnovers with the Bears, but it elevated the energy for his team and the crowd inside this arena. Vanderwall a couple of free throws. And that's not just a coaching move that was organic to the halftime locker room. No doubt Bob and his staff looking at every speck of the two previous games against this Mercer team and Greg Gary likewise. But one of the things they had in their arsenal that they needed it was 
Hey, we need to go full court pressure. A, you know about the point guard issues for Mercer, but more importantly, having seen how it could have worked had they employed it in the previous matchup. Absolutely. They tried that 1-3-1 in the first half, and well, Mercer, they didn't they didn't do it very often, but Mercer was able to break it. Shot clock at 10, the pull-up for Walker. Boy, Mercer desperately needing a basket, trailing by double figures for the first time this afternoon. All Furman here in the second half so far. Slauson the screen for Pegues. Look for the back cut. Now Pegues, plenty of time on the shot clock. He'll fire for three over Grant. And off the floor, McCrary gets the rebound. I thought he was going to go back inside to Slauson, who had that kind of a mismatch size advantage. Greg Gary telling us that so many guys on his team have had a hard time grasping the reality that is, I've got to make a play. And a lot of them at key points in a game. I think we're at a key point in this contest for the Mercer Bears. Grant, not a bad idea with four on the shot clock. It comes away to Slauson. Here come the Paladins. Pagese. Give him 19. With one timeout to use. Equality. No, I, I, look, if both teams have, can go to their benches, but, you know, for Furman, yeah, I mean, you go to, you go to Vanderwall, you go to Carter Witt and Alex Williams as they continue to struggle. No timeouts. Backcourt violation. Bob Ritchie providing the added edge of excitement in the background of the picture. Again, Quinones not try, not finding help, having a hard time seeing over the long stretched arms of Ben Vanderwall. See Vanderwall as the back dribble occurs now. When you pick up your dribble, you're really guarding yourself. So now it's three on O. McCreary's gone to the bench. Last night, Bears went on a 16 to three run without him in the lineup, and they were able to come back and retake the lead in the opening half while he sat in foul trouble. Five on the shot clock. Vanderwall. Foster around Walker. Into Heen. And one. No, a shot clock violation. Heard the whistle and thought the obvious, but yep. he did not get it down in time. A oh, good defensive possession right there for the Bears. It was the not right thing to do by Foster to dump it down, but that red light goes off just before yep. Heen is able to release it. I'm not sure that backboard went up. They break the press that time, but then the deflection near midcourt. He told you, Bob Ritchie thinks the deflections are just like a steal. That's what he really tries for defensively. Foster off balance. Foul will be called. Shannon Grant will pick up the first one. Mercer Bears down by 13. They haven't scored in over five minutes on the game clock. They are really here in Asherwich again. You and I haven't seen them work this season. If they are able to get that first bid to the big dance in a long time that's a weapon that could work for them against a higher seeded team in the NCAA tourney as Marcus Foster continues a solid day and looks to make it two of two and build on this biggest lead of the game and now it's 15. That's uh it's just not been fun for Mercer right nine turnovers here where they haven't even played eight minutes or just over eight minutes. Front court Robertson Long time since Mercer has scored any points. And now they're able to set it, but still, you've got to make some plays when the play breaks down if you're Mercer. Who's that guy that can go do that? Maybe it's Glisson. Out of bounds, back over to the Paladins. And not to mention the fact, Furman is a difficult team to play from the opening tip at 0-0. A difficult team to play when you haven't had a day of rest, an extra day of rest like the Paladins have, but a really hard team to come back on yeah, now because down, of the way they, yeah, they defend. That's right. Down 15 now is potentially down like 20 or 25 against somebody else. And because they can also score. They average 82 points plus a game, so if you are in a situation where you're getting a little run going, they can at least trade and keep the, yep. the margin in terms of their lead the same. Shot clock under 15. Bears extending the defense. Heen fires over it. And Glisson and the Bears go the other way and off the miss. Paladins don't set up a press of any kind. And a bit of a break for the Bears. Kenones changing hands in the lane. Well, they'll take it any way they can get it. 
just something to stop the bleeding and try to get that that 6-0 or that 8-2 run to get this back to a single digit deficit. First basket since a 735 mark for the Mercer Bears. We thought points in the paint was the big story in the opening half. It was for Mercer. Pagese tried to get two of his own close to the basket. He'll now try to do so at the free throw line. But obviously the forced turnovers and points off of those have been a bigger story for Furman since the break. And they've created some unique opportunities and situations that you see Grant there having to guard Pagese. That's not the first time this half that he's been put in some difficult situations defensively. Pagese arguably the most improved player in the Southern Conference. Tip of the hat to Corey Tripp at Walford who also had a really good second year for the Terriers, but Pagese, a guy so much was counted on by him, and he has delivered after the graduation of Alex Hunter. 20 points, Pagese leads all scorers here, and betters the 18-point effort he had last Wednesday against the Bears. Walker hung up, listen, in the front court. 14-point deficit for the Bears with the ball. Coming up on 10 to go. Second half of game one on quarterfinal Saturday here at the Ingalls. SoCon Championships, just a great day of basketball. Shot clock under five. Kinone's forcing. Got the rim. Robertson off the deflection. Glisson. And a block by the best in the league. Slauson. Foul at midcourt. Now granted, Jake Stevens of Chattanooga can also be in that argument, but Slauson doing the defensive things that he does. Yeah, and that got the fans as fired up. Watch it right there. He just meets Glisson right at the rim. That's just a terrific individual move by Jalen Slauson not giving up on the play after Kamar Robertson was able to come up with the turnover. Can he meet him right there. I don't know if Glisson was going to lay it in or dunk it, but either way, Slauson got the better of that one right there. Third foul on Canones. Slauson coming out of the regular season just shy of 50. Alley oop, soft touch. Well, and when you play good defense, whether it's full court or half court, like Furman is doing now, good offense just seems to happen. And Six. conversely, it's hard when you're not scoring. Canone's getting the roll. Paladins wanted basket interference. But keep in mind, out of the locker room, Bears have managed just eight points. They were up by three at the break. A thunderous first ten minutes plus here in the second half for the number one seed. You get the sense that maybe Mercer has kind of dug in now and they've got they've gotten back to their senses but you know you made the point earlier you're down 14 against a team like this that has multiple weapons so difficult almost unfair all that he can do close to the basket and then a soft touch 38 percent beyond the arc to lead the team he had 27 against Mercer in the last meeting 42 in the two games during the regular season and he's been a big scorer here in the second half Slauson in double figures now with 10 Robertson trying to answer. Strong battle for the rebound. And Canones is fouled. Think for a moment what Jalen Slauson has done here in about 11 and a half minutes. We've seen steals for dunks. We've seen threes. We've seen blocks at the rim. I mean, it's just, it's not just been the, the Slauson show, but he is proving why he is the Southern Conference Player of the Year in 22-23 season. And it's, it's hard to ever mention Slauson without mentioning his fellow fifth-year senior and his good friend Mike Bothwell. Slauson shows the emotion, let's say, that Bothwell doesn't. One has, well, so. it's, it's an odd couple of sorts in that regard. The, the numbers they produce and the success obviously congruent, but in the case, one is that emotional guy, the other kind of the, the calm customer, if you will. And Slauson will get a breather. What a second half he's had. Canones trying to get it under the basket to Glisson. It'll go back the other way. Williams and Huey doing a nice job down low. Two guys off the bench, right? Williams and Huey, you talked about the strength of their bench as these freshmen and sophomores for Furman have gotten experience. They're able to come in and just keep the music playing. 
You'll manage a game differently in baseball when you can rely on your bullpen and Pagis just blowing by Glisson. Getting close to a 20-point advantage. You'll coach a basketball game much differently, Dean, as, as you know, as Vanderwall gets the steal. And he'll go to the line when you can rely on players like Vanderwall bringing quality like that onto the court into a ball game. Just another active body right here. Look at it. Back and forth, bluff and retreat, as we say, by Vanderwall. He gets his hand on. He gets the steal. Paladin's having a lot of fun right now with this pressure. Number four on Canones, who has assumed their point guard role for the most part this year. Sparks will check in for Robertson. Paladin's growing their biggest lead. Up by as many as six in the first half, down by three at the break. And now a 21-point advantage. Sparks saw his playing time increase in early February. Canones stays on the court with the four fouls. Listen, trying to get it away. Dangerous pass. Zanoni. Keep an eye on Zanoni beyond the perimeter. He's one of the better outside shooters, especially with Robertson over on the bench. Coming up on seven and a half to go. Coming up on five on the shot clock. And Williams will be called for the personal. We'll see three throws for Canones. Just pick something you want Jalen Slauson to do, and he's more than happy to shoot. Definitely been able to load up the box score this season, whether it's points, rebounds, assists, steals, and blocks, because he averages more than one steal and one block a game. He's also really worked on his mental game. Head coach Bob Ritchie said that he still plays with a lot of motion on the court, but he's able to stay inside of the game more and not allow those emotions to come out as much as they used to. I know you guys can talk to how he played as a freshman, sophomore, younger uh, paladin back in the day, but he can still affect the game in so many ways and has a better control of that emotional side. And the other part of the dynamic duo, Bothwell giving it out high. Under 10 of the shot clock. Well, the paladins... Of course, a game coming up tomorrow afternoon. Probably in no hurry. Up by 21, Vanderwall. Another offensive rebound. Mercer right down there at the bottom of the SoCon and defensive boards. And Bothwell and company make him pay. You can't give Furman a second chance, especially in a scramble situation. So good, so so athletic to be able to make plays one on one. With forcing the steal. Williams back to Bothwell, who thought about it. And the beauty of Mike Bothwell being able to run an offense as well as score as a two or a three. Dump inside. Pagese, or rather Huey, down low, finding Vanderwall, who will head back to the line. Such good offense. Follow the play right here. You see Witt drive it, and then the cut by Bothwell, recognizing that the lane was open. That's just a read and react. That's not a set basketball play, but that's it's a guy right there, Bothwell, who's played a lot of college basketball. He's been a lot of high-level games knowing what to do. Ben Vanderwall from just outside of Chicago. Really solid player, and he'll just continue to emerge as time goes on for him in the Paladins program. Can't get the second to go down. He's got six points off the bench. Under six and a half to go in regulation. A game that turned in roughly the first two minutes or so of this second half. Because the Paladins turned up the full court pressure. McCreary trying to follow his foul. Any so ideas to the run Bob Ritchie has had after ascending to the head coaching job and now guiding this Furman team in his sixth season. This team has been able to have four 20-plus win campaigns. The only year they didn't get to 20 was in the COVID-impacted season of 2020 and 21. They had back-to-back 25-win -back seasons in 18-19 and 19-20 as McCreary. Not heard from all that much since he scored six early points. Gets it to go. And here they are on the verge of a 25th win. Three 25-win seasons in your first six rare, rare. years as a head coach. Yeah. <laughs> Let alone your first six years on the job at a school. And uh, pretty impressive stuff. 
in what has been a very good league. Mind you, Wofford and ETSU and UNCG teams in the conference during those years that Furman was right there with knocking off in the regular season and coming up just shy against and so con tourney play. That's a great point. Mike, Mike Young had arguably the best Wofford team ever. 18-19, they, they won 30 games. And what Steve Forbes did at ETSU, Wes Miller at UNCG. Yeah, this, it wasn't as though what Bob Ritchie helped Nico Medved start and then take over was against a really weak or watered down. It was really when the conference was at its best in recent time. You've become tired of hearing me say it as Whit went for the steal and commits the foul. Of course, ETSU, and for that matter, the Sanford women, had the celebration and the confetti falling down upon them with championships here at the SOCON tourney in 2020. Of course, it was just a few days later the nation shut down so they couldn't make their trips. This year, the Furman Paladins hope to be the next on the rung on that list. The past four head coaches of the SOCON championship team have moved on to power conference jobs. They've all done a fantastic job here and are doing a good job at their current locations. Mont Paris will get South Carolina going. They've Tough shown team. improvement in the second half of their season. Another steal by the Paladins. And some fun for Vanderwall. McCreary and Slauson committing the person. Broken record partner, defense to offense in a blink of an eye. Look how quick this happens. The steal, one dribble, one pass. And then Vanderbilt, just like that, boy, they are so good, and they understand how to do it. It's a part of their culture and their offense. I'll tell you what, their their passion and their purpose coming out of the locker room has been so much greater than just the challenge of trying to come back and beat Mercer. That guy right there leads them, but just multiple guys that can beat you in a lot of different ways. McCrary only double figure scorer for the Bears. He makes this on 14. Western Carolina and ETSU should be most entertaining in quarterfinal game number two. Coming up right here where you're watching about a half an hour after this one ends. There's already a lot of purple in this arena. There will be a ton. I guess is the. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> a ton of oh my goodness <laughs> dropped upon us from high above. Slossett. Mid sentence, I apologize for that. But oh, no need to. After doing and don't it. apologize to Slauson either. He won't accept it. So no need. Paladins looked like they were back in that zone, but no, they're now just switching. Canone strong move inside and able to get the foul call. It's right high again with Jalen Slauson. You can never watch it too many times. The handoff and then McCrary gets caught in between. He doesn't know if he needs to contain Pagis, and then that frees Slauson to run to the rim. And he is a guy, if you throw it anywhere near that 10-foot cylinder, well, he is he's going to be able to finish it in a good way. Jock Canones, very physical presence at the point guard position. 6'4", 220, and it's really come along this year, but there will be even better days ahead for him in this Bears program. Can't get the second. McCreary still fighting, as is Hurtado. But Bothwell comes away with it. It's interesting. Last Saturday, Furman, with a lot on the line, because they really wanted to be the number one seed, for one, for the two fifth-year seniors, and wow. Slauson was one dribble away from being able to corral and maybe bring down the whole basket support that time but last week that was a playoff game a tournament game for them if you will because he and Bothell really wanted to put down the marker of first number one seed since 91. Part of their legacy absolutely and it was an early lead the game stuck on five to two I think for about the first seven minutes between two of the highest scoring teams in the league were out of the bucket and then Bothwell went nuts scored the first 18 points that turned out for Furman and they were able to keep Sanford at bay the rest of the contest. This game, obviously a much different story, but the resourcefulness for Slauson and the Paladins and all the different kinds of ways they've won games this year. It's not like a template that most teams have to follow. 
They're best in transition and getting up and down, getting the game hot and into the 80s. But to your point, they've won games slower. And then we see tonight or this afternoon, coming out of halftime, they employ this full court pressure that literally in the blink of an eye just, boy, it changed the game. And you saw the lack of ball handling by Mercer. Things just started to wobble. And you know the adage about teams that press don't like to be pressed. It would have been natural for Bob Ritchie to think, well, Sanford likes to press. Maybe we'll try a full court press on them. McCreary, hard foul that time on Foster. But Bob Ritchie never used the press, or at least didn't use it full court last week. His team can begin focusing on a Sunday afternoon in the second half. In every measurable way, at both ends of the court, Furman has been dominant. You know, now 40 to 17 score wise, they forced. 12 Mercer turnovers in the second half doing part to that pressure and they've got points in the paint and points off fast breaks that they just weren't able to do in the first half they've spread the well scoring wise the geese and Bothwell have checked out with 22 and 13 points respectively but Foster now with nine As he headed to the bench. Sloss in 12 points doing damage. You could argue as much defensively in the second half as offensively. Paladins will rest the starters other than he and you would assume the rest of the way. Robertson winding down his career with the Bears. Williams had it knocked away. Hurtado. Well, you like that there's fight left in the Bears. It's more than likely too little too late, but Kamar Robertson, Luis Hurtado, and others continue to battle. Furman, 17 points off turnovers in the second half. Bears just reached 19 total since the break. Lob by Witt, intended for Huey. Canones, full head of steam. Likewise for McCrary. 16 for a guy who began at South Florida. Headed on up to Columbia, South Carolina. And now he's with this Bears team. Love to have him for one more year. Vanderwall lost the defender and finished at the rim. And he's really had an impressive second half. We've talked so much about Slauson and Bothwell, but in Vanderwall, and he's been really good in front of the press. Vanderwall sees Hurtado kick it in the corner. Zanoni. Freshman out of the Charlotte area. Played at Greensboro Day. Really good program in the triad of North Carolina. And one of the few mistakes the Paladins have made really overall in this game, but in the second half. Just a couple of turnovers, but boy, there'll be a lot to like. Bob Ritchie just talks about this game, watches the film. I mean, he's got to be really proud of how his team responded to a little bit of adversity through the first 20 minutes no panic they have shown why they're the number one seed here in the last 19 minutes Zanoni would have been a three he's right near the line Furman Paladin's about to make it 18 in a row in this series be hard pressed to find any other matchup among conference teams around the nation where that kind of run continues Bob Ritchie will go to 15 and 0 as a head coach against the Bears Difficult stat to really understand. You know, there are there are good days ahead for this Mercer program. I know through the injuries, Grant and Glisson never 100%. All the other things that have happened this year, even Kamar Robertson continues to battle. Greg Gary, I mean, guys like Zanoni, Quinones, young guys. They've added some, some high school guys. I'm sure they'll go to the portal. They'll be back. They will be successful next year. Great guards coming from the Midwest. Uh, point guard and the combo guard they've signed. Point down to the telegraph last night. One of the guards they've signed has established an Indiana career record for taking charges. <laughs> so that's an energy play. Vanderwall's going to end up with double figures in his first Southern Conference tournament game. 11 for the player came to them from the Midwest from just outside of Chicago as a freshman. As you see, we're getting ready for Western Carolina and ETSU. Inside, McCreary has it knocked away. Not only 
two teams with a lot of talent on the court. And the Western Carolina Catamounts, when they're on, they're on, and they've got good scores all throughout their starting five. But that is one of the really good rivalries in the SOCOM, the Blue Ridge Border Rivals. And they will battle here in Asheville for a third time this season. And Western Carolina turned the trend in that series this year after ETSU had dominated for a long time. Huey was trying to show Slauson his hops as his teammate watches from the bench. Final seconds will wind down. Hurtado. Canones. I think he was trying to look for one of the seniors. Maybe McCreary down low. Up and under. And he'll have an 18-point game. Furman Paladins arrive at win number 25 for the third time over the past six seasons. Their first game since that moment last March here in Asheville. 73 to 58. On they go to the semifinals. Bob Ritchie and Greg Gary, guys who have mutual respect. And the Paladins head coach will now get his team ready for either.